Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well. Uh, this is Rob, and today we're going to talk about oh, once how to mute that window. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, an introduction to SharePoint Framework or SharePoint Framework Basics. Um, I'm going to be giving an extended version of the presentation that I give at conferences on the introduction to the uh, SharePoint Framework. All right, so let me switch over to my uh, VM here. So let's start out by talking about why Microsoft created uh, the SharePoint framework. When SharePoint first, or when Microsoft first started developing the SharePoint, it was you know in the early 2000s. In fact, it was probably even before 2000. Uh, the first version came out in 2001. Um, but the first the first .NET version came out, or the first version based on .NET came out in 2003. And at that point in time the only web development framework Microsoft had for .NET was web forms, ASP.NET ASP web forms. Um, and then, you know, SharePoint grew, so we got SharePoint 2007 and 2010, 2013, and so on. And Microsoft just constantly added to their code base. Um, but as time went on, this, or the fact that the SharePoint framework was developed using web forms became problematic because Microsoft wanted now, you know, in the 2000, um, let's say 2014, 15 timeframe to kind of start being able to support um, machines other than desktops and laptops. So that would be tablets and phones. Uh, basically, what they wanted to do was make the the user experience that SharePoint gave you uh, responsive, and that isn't easy to do when your pages are based on web forms. So they kind of pondered what you know what they could do, and obviously, I mean, one of the answers would have been to completely rebuild SharePoint, but um, while it's technically an answer, it's feasibly not. All right, there's just no way that Microsoft could go back and re-engineer SharePoint from the ground up. Uh, so they had to come up with a, a, a different mechanism, one that was still based on web forms, but allowed them to build modern, responsive user interfaces. And the solution they came up with was this thing called the modern user experience. So basically, the pages are still web forms pages, but the user experience is not in any way generated using the web forms controls or types. Um, it's basically each page is just a giant hole and that hole gets filled up th with um, HTML and JavaScript and CSS and other you know, static assets, okay? So using this technique, Microsoft was able to give the experience that they wanted without having to completely re-engineer um, how SharePoint worked. Now, what it does mean is that for developers, there's a brand new model, which depending on how you count, uh, you know, is the third or fourth development model for SharePoint. Um, most people say the, f the fourth major one. Um, so that there's, there's definitely a learning curve or an adjustment going from, let's say for example, you're building uh, you know, uh, on-premises web parts or features and that kind of stuff for SharePoint 2010 or 2013 to learning how to work with the, the, the SharePoint framework. But once you've sort of gotten over that hump, um, you'll, you'll probably end up seeing, uh, as I have, that there's, there's a lot of value there, right? So we're going to have to learn, a, a, we'll, and we'll talk about this as we go throughout the, uh, the cast here, the stream here, um, about you know the the different tool sets that we're going to be using and and the way that we end up developing um, either web parts or extensions for the SharePoint framework. Okay. Um, so actually, I don't think I need to cover uh, that slide. So I talked about the different tooling. Uh, Microsoft when they when they decided that they were going to go with this modern user experience and go to the SharePoint framework, and the SharePoint framework is the development uh, tool set, the development process that we use for developing modern user experience. Um, 
they decided to use the sort of modern web stack in terms of development. So instead of cracking open, you know, Visual Studio 2017 or 2019 and saying file new project, we're instead going to use a set of open source command line tools um, to develop SharePoint framework uh, projects. So we're going to we're, we're going to be using tools like Node. Um, Node is sort of the the framework that underlies all the development. Um, it also acts as a web server when we're doing development, and we'll see that. Um, we're going to be using um, npm, which is a package manager similar to NuGet. So if we want to add in other packages into our application, we can do that. But npm is also used for installing tools um, and, and doing a few other things that we don't uh, use NuGet for in um, traditional Visual Studio development. In terms of a task runner, um, so MS Build and Gulp are sort of logically similar. So Gulp is our, our task runner. Instead of using VB or C Sharp as our development language, we're going to be using TypeScript. Uh, TypeScript is a language sh that should be familiar to C Sharp developers because a lot of the language elements, things like classes and interfaces and generics and stuff like that, um, are there in, in TypeScript. And finally, uh, we're going to be using Yeoman. Uh, for project generation. So where in Visual Studio, we would say file new project. Um, we're going to use Yeoman. So on the command line, we'll type Yo, and then give it a template name and answer some questions, and it'll generate a, a, a project for us. Now, you can actually use Visual Studio to do development if you really want to. Um, a couple gentlemen, uh, Eric Shups and Paul Schaefline, created a uh, Visual Studio extension or add-in that you can use. Um, and basically all it does is in Visual Studio, it goes and calls the tooling that we're going to be using on the command line. Um, so it's going to be using Yeoman and Gulp and NPM and, and those tools behind the scenes. But if you really, really want to do Visual Studio, you can. The one thing you need to keep aware of is that the Visual Studio extension may or may not support the most recent SharePoint framework generator um, because there might be some additions to the extension or add-in to Visual Studio that are required to are um, required when a new version of the SharePoint framework generator comes out. So there might be a slight delay there. Um, you can absolutely use that in Visual Studio should you choose to. Oh, we went there already. Um, so what can you build with the SharePoint framework, right? Uh, and basically right now, there's, there's three things. I'll cover two of them uh, today. One of them is uh, client-side web parts. So at a 10,000-foot view, these are exactly the same as web parts that we've developed for on-premises versions of SharePoint. So SharePoint 2013 or 2010 or 2007. In that, they're little chunks of user interface that are available to users through a gallery or a toolbox that they can add onto a page in certain areas of the page. And then once the web part is added to the page, they can go and set properties on that web part. Right. So again, at a very high level, the client-side web parts are exactly the same as the server-side web parts we used to develop in Visual Studio. However, um, in an implementation standpoint, they're completely different because instead of using, you know, VB or C Sharp and um, web forms, we're instead using uh, TypeScript and uh, H basically HTML and JavaScript to develop them. So we'll see that uh, a little bit later on. The other thing we can build are SharePoint framework extensions. So there's three kinds of extensions, an application customizer, a field customizer, and a command set customizer. Sorry about that. Um, so an application customizer enables you to build a, a, a header and or a footer that you can inject into all of the pages within your tenant or within a specific site collection or a specific set of site collections. So you can put whatever content you want in there. But right, basically right now, there's, there's two places where you can add content that's at the top of the page or at the bottom of the page, that's the header and the footer. 
The field customizer enables you to modify how a specific column is shown in a list view. Now, this was first introduced prior to the introduction of the JSON column formatting or the JSON view formatting. So today, most people would do um, what you can do with the field customizer using the JSON column formatting. However, if you want to do something really, really uh, difficult to do with the JSON or, or not possible to do with the JSON column formatting, you, could, you can fall back to using uh, a field customizer. Um, so again, not super popular, or not, it's not used extensively because of the fact that now you can do a lot of what you would, you would have done using this technology um, using the JSON column formatting. The last thing you can build in terms of a customizer is a command set customizer. So this enables you to put buttons into the command bar or at, uh, and or add items into the context menu for a list item that you would access through the ellipsis. Uh, so basically what you can do is say, well, if uh, one item or multiple items are selected, I want to have these commands show, uh, so these buttons or these menu options show. Or you can say, I always want these buttons or menu op options to show. And then depending on what the user clicks and what items are selected, item or items are selected, you can then perform certain actions on that item or, or those items. So um, that's a very powerful customizer that you can use. Now, now that we've talked about what you can build, this, sorry, I sh should just step back here. There's one additional thing you can build which, not, which is not covered in the slides, and that's a, a library extension. Uh, sorry, a library. Um, you can think of a library like a DLL in the .NET world. It's basically um, uh, a package you can create that can be shared across multiple projects. I'm not going to cover libraries in this particular um, uh, session or stream. Now, what do you need for your development env environment? So basically, you need Node, Yeoman, Gulp, and the Yeoman SharePoint project generator. You also need a, a text editor that works with folder-based project structures. So instead of having like a CS proj or an SLN file um, like you do in Visual Studio, the projects are all based on the folder structure. So a folder and its subfolders are effectively a project, um, and you'll, we'll see that uh, a little bit later on. So there's lots of information on how to, um, to do this. One, you can go to the documentation that I've got highlighted here. So let me just go grab that. And actually, let me just show you another way to go instead of directly through the URL. So if you go to um, docs.microsoft.com slash SharePoint, and then go to um, SharePoint Developer here, and then in the left-hand menus, you can under SharePoint Framework, choose Getting Started, and then um, set up your development environment. It talks about the process you need to go ahead and do this. So the first thing you're going to do is install Node. Now, there's one really important thing here. Let me go to the Node website. So it's nodejs.org. Generally, what you want to do is install the LTS, or long-term support version. Unfortunately, at this point in time, uh, the LTS version is incompatible with the SharePoint framework. So right now, with the SharePoint framework, you can, you can use Node version 8.x, so anything with a major version of 8, or Node 10.x. Um, you cannot use Node 12.x, which is the current long-term support version. So if you can see here, um, it talks about how to install Node LTS version 10. All right. So as I mentioned, it's, you can either use 8 or you can use 10. One important note is if you plan on targeting um, SharePoint 2016. Now, let me just step back a little bit. Uh, you can run the SharePoint framework on SharePoint 2016, SharePoint 2019, or SharePoint Online. Okay. SharePoint 2016 only supports development of web parts. It does not support development of extensions or libraries. Uh, SharePoint 2019 supports both extensions and web parts. 
And then SharePoint Online supports everything that the SharePoint framework is, it makes available to you, right? So all the, the innovation happens at SharePoint Online. And then when new versions of uh, SharePoint Server come out, the, there's a snapshot done of the current um, SharePoint framework version, and that's what's available to um, the previous, or sorry, the on-premises versions uh, of, of SharePoint. So you can build a project that targets SharePoint 2016 uh, or SharePoint 2016 and SharePoint 2019 or SharePoint 2016 and 2019 and SharePoint Online or SharePoint 2019 or SharePoint 2019 and SharePoint Online or just SharePoint Online. Um, and of course, if you target all three, then you can only use web parts. So you basically use the one that has the, the least support, but it's supported across all, all three versions. So getting back to what, you know, why is this important when we talk about Node? If you are going to target SharePoint 2016, then you need to install Node 8, not Node 10. Otherwise, I generally suggest that you install Node 10. So if we go back to the Node website and then go to Downloads and then scroll down a bit and go to Previous Releases, there we can get the releases for Node 10 or Node 8. And if you're on Windows, and let me try to bump up the font here a little bit, generally you want to install, um, pick the installer, so the MSI down here at the bottom. So there is the 64-bit and 32-bit versions of the Node version 10.18.0 installer there. All right, so that's the first step is to go in and install Node. And then once you have that, you can use NPM to install um, Gulp, Yeoman, and the SharePoint Framework Generator. All right, so this is the command to install both Yeoman and Gulp and then the command to install the um, SharePoint Framework Generator. So we're currently on version 1.9.1 of the SharePoint Framework Generator. There's been many versions prior to that. So 1.8, 1 uh, 1.7, and so on, uh, as you can imagine. But we're currently on 1.9.1, and uh, the release of SharePoint Framework 1.10 is imminent. Um, hopefully, it's like within the next week or, you know, a week, next week ish, sometime maybe sometime this week, uh, would be would be great. Um, and when the you know each version of the SharePoint Framework Generator adds new functionality or fixes existing functionality that um, in the previous version of the SharePoint Framework Generator. So again, as I mentioned, we're currently on um, version 1.9.1. And running this command here will go ahead and install that on your system. And the last thing you need to do, and this is a one-time thing only, is um, trust the dev cert so that when we go to debug our SharePoint Framework web part in the local workbench, which is something we'll see in just a bit, um, that you won't get an error in the browser saying, oh, you're trying to you know, use HTTPS, but it's not. there's no certificate there. Uh, it's not a trusted uh, source, so and, and, and so on. So this whole process from start to finish generally takes like 15, 15 minutes ish. It's not it's it's not super. It's not a super long process. Now there's another way to get the same kind of information. Um, so if I go to um, aka.ms/spfxtraining. And there's a, a similar link to this later on in the resources. Uh, but for now, I'll put this link in the chat. Uh, and then go ahead and press Enter here. This is a bunch of training modules that Microsoft makes available to you. And the very first one here, getting started with the SharePoint framework, if we go to the GitHub repository for that, and then scroll down a little bit and go to the lab. This lab walks you through the entire process. Whoops. Uh, walks you through the entire process of, um, of installing, get, getting your development environment set up, um, creating your first web part project, and so on. Okay. We'll also need an app catalog. Uh, that's another thing that we'll talk about a little bit later on in the stream. 
Um, but so this is another way of go going through the same thing in terms of setting up your tenant, setting up your development environment uh, in more of a lab scenario rather than in um, just the, the docs there. So one, either one will work um, just fine. All right, so let's switch back to the slides here. Now, one of the things you're going to need uh, to do this or work with this stuff is a develop uh, is, a, is a tenant, and if you already have a production tenant, you can absolutely use that. Um, but I highly recommend that if, whether it's for learning or whether it's for your actual work development, um, that you use a developer tenant. So you're not working with the same, you know, production site collections or production uh, SharePoint assets or production data that you do the development in a developer tenant and then you take the completed work and you move that over into your production tenant. And you can sign up for a, an Office 365 developer tenant by going to um, dev.office.com slash dev program. Uh, it'll ask you a few different questions. Uh, and then you, what you do is you get a 25 user tenant that's good for three months. Now, Microsoft monitors the tenant and if you're using it for development purposes, then they'll extend to an, for another three months. And if you continue to use it for development purposes, then they'll extend for another three months and so on. And there's a dashboard that you can see when you first create your tenant or you can go back to it later on, which shows how many days you have left on your tenant and um, um, if you're going to get extended and so on. So that, that's available for you as well. So as I mentioned, the only thing you really need to do in your developer tenant is create an app catalog. So if you've done any kind of add-in development, so SharePoint hosted add-ins or um, provider hosted add-ins, you deploy those to, to SharePoint Online through, or, or even SharePoint on-premises through an app catalog. We use the exact same app catalog to deploy um, our SharePoint framework assets, SharePoint framework projects into into SharePoint Online. Um, so I think that's enough of the slides for now. Let's actually get into uh, to a demo. So I'm just going to come over to my Windows Explorer here, and I'm going to create a new folder. So I'll right-click and choose New Folder. And I'll call this folder Hello Twitch. And then I'm just going to Shift right-click on that folder and choose open command window here. Okay, So once you've installed Node and all the other tools, you can work with them through any command prompt. Or there's other shells that are specifically designed for um, working with Node. I'm just going to use a command prompt. I could use PowerShell. Um, you know, basically any, uh, or I could use the new Windows sh uh, shell. The, uh, any, basically any shell will work just fine. Uh, it doesn't really matter. And then now I want to use Yeoman. So I talked about Yeoman being a tool that we can use to generate a project. And what I need to tell Yeoman is what project template do I want to use. And the Microsoft SharePoint one, SharePoint framework one, is at Microsoft slash SharePoint. Okay, and what's going to happen now is I'm going to get asked a few questions to determine what project it should create. So first off, what's your solution name? Um, an individual SharePoint framework project can have multiple web parts or web part and extensions or you know extensions. You can add multiple things to it. It's just going to start out with one thing in it. So we'll say the solution name here is Hello Twitch. What baseline packages do you want to target for your components? So as I mentioned, we can use um, SharePoint. We can target SharePoint 2016, SharePoint 2019, and or SharePoint Online, right? So whichever one is the earliest one you want to target, you pick that one. So if we only want to target SharePoint Online, we choose the highlighted option. If we want to use SharePoint 2016 alone, or SharePoint 2016 and SharePoint 2019, or SharePoint 2016, 2019, and SharePoint Online, then we choose this one. And then if we want to target SharePoint 2019 or SharePoint 2019 and SharePoint Online, we use the last one. And as I mentioned, um, this one supports all the newest stuff in the SharePoint framework. 
This option only supports web parts, and this option supports web parts and extensions. So we're going to be targeting SharePoint Online, so I'll choose that option. Where do I want to place the files that this generator is going to generate? I just created a folder for it, and I have opened up in that folder, so I'm going to use the current folder. Do you want to allow the tenant admin the choice of being able to deploy the solution to all sites immediately without running any feature deployment or adding apps and sites? Okay. So what this is saying is, um, do you want your tenant admin to be able to say, I just want to make this web part or this extension available across my entire tenant? Now, it's not saying that that will happen. It's saying you're going to give your admin the option for that to happen. The alternative is that when any site collection you want to use the web part or the extension, you have to go in and choose add an app. And then in the add an app page, pick the actual extension or web part project. Right? So you have the choice of doing either one. If you only want to have certain site collections, you use the web part or extension, you can choose to do that. Or you can say, just make this available across my entire tenant. And again, the choice here is not saying that will happen. It's saying your admin will have the option for that to happen. And we'll see that when we get to deployment where that actually comes into play. So here I'm going to choose Y for yes. There's another question here that has to do with isolated web parts. And, I, and I'm not going to talk about that right now because I think it's too complicated or too complex a topic. We don't have enough foundation discussed at this point for you to really understand um, what, what, what the ramifications are here. So unless you absolutely know that you want this, I just suggest you always say no here. Okay. Now, what are we going to build? A web part or an extension or a library? So we'll start out by building a web part. So I'll choose that. And what's the name of the web part going to be? I'll say it's Hello Twitch. What's the description of the project? Um, generally, I just leave the default here. This is something we can edit later on. And then which framework do you want to use? Now, this really should say what user, um, user interface or user experience framework do you want to use? Um, and the choices are a no JavaScript framework, React, or Knockout. Okay. Um, so no JavaScript framework means you're just going to use HTML and JavaScript. You're not going to use any kind of UI framework. Um, if you choose React, then you're going to use React as your UI framework. N Knockout is there still. I don't know a whole lot of people who are using Knockout, but if, if that's something you want to use for data binding, um, you, you, you can do it. Now, this, this generator is the, the generator, this project generator, right, the, the SharePoint Framework Yeoman generator, is the generator that's made available from the Microsoft team, um, and it provides us with these options. There is another generator that the community has created uh, the PNP framework generator, and it gives you other options. So if you want to use Vue or you want to use Angular Elements, then you can use that, right? So I'm showing you the official one from Microsoft, but there's another one that is that you know the community is is generated that provides you other options for generating a project that uses other um, UI frameworks, and that is available to you should you choose um, to use it. But for right now, I'm going to keep things simple and just say no JavaScript framework. All right, so what's happening at this point? Well, if we come over to e dev hello Twitch, we can see we've got a whole bunch of files that are created for us here, OK? Um, OK, that's cool. That's what we expected. It's a project generator, so we expect it to generate files. Um, but what we can see now is it's doing some other work here. Um, so what exactly is that? Well, what it's doing is it's downloading all the packages um, that we're going to use to both develop our web part and when our web part runs in production, use it, um, sorry, and the, the packages that are used um, and bundled with the web part um, for during production. Okay. Um, and this process, depending on the speed of your internet and the speed of your computer, can take a few minutes. Okay. So let's go take a look at another project that I've pre-created. So I'll go to dev, 
And I'm going to use this one called Hello World here. So I'll shift right click on that and choose Open Command Window. Uh, sorry, not Hello Twitch. I wanted this one here, Hello World. And let's take a look inside of here. So what's being downloaded are the files inside of this Node Modules folder. And you can see that there are a lot of subfolders. Okay, so your project has a bunch of dependencies, both for development and for a production. And those packages have their own dependencies and all of those things have to get downloaded to your machine. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, if we take a look here at the Hello World folder uh, and right click and choose properties, we'll see that we have 400 or 500 megabytes worth of files. Oh, we're going to get more here. Oh, that's not right. Am I, I must have chosen the wrong. Yeah, I chose the wrong folder. Hold on. Hello world properties. There we go. 421 megabytes. Okay. Um, and that's because basically, you know, like in Visual Studio, let's say we're doing SharePoint 2013 development. And we go into Visual Studio and say, file new SharePoint project and farm solution or sandbox solution, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, we say, okay, create. Well, all of the base types that are being used, you know, Microsoft.SharePoint and um, all of the .NET framework, class libraries and so on are already on our machine. And they're all used globally, right? Well, that's not the case here. The case here is where basically every project has all the stuff that it needs in that folder for the project. So that's why the, the, the folder structures become quite large. But it is something to be very cognizant of depending on how much disk space you have. Because if you create a whole bunch of test projects or learning projects or work projects, um, they can eat up your disk space real, real quick. So that's something to be cognizant of and it's something I'll address a little bit later on um, in this stream. All right, so at this point, um, we can see that Hello Twitch has finished here. Uh, and again, if we go over to the Hello Twitch folder and go to Node Modules, you can see all those um, files and modules are there and have been downloaded to our machine. Okay. All right, so let's just go with Hello Twitch here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to open up the project in Visual Studio Code. So I've downloaded and installed Visual Studio Code. It's a free, um, lightweight version of Visual Studio. Um, so to find it, just go to your favorite search engine and search for uh, Visual Studio Code. And you can go ahead and um, download that to your machine. And it's a folder, uh, the, the folder structure is the project uh, and it's a, it's a really lightweight editor and it's cross-platform. So you can use it for Windows or you can use it on Mac or Linux, um, whatever one you happen to be using. Okay, so to go ahead and open up this project in Visual Studio Code, I'm gonna say code dot. Right, so basically open the current folder in Visual Studio Code. And um, we got a couple pop-ups here. And there's a bunch of files here in this um, project that uh, are important. So let's just go through them. I'm going to start in the config folder. Well, actually, let me start in the source folder. Um, so you can see there's web parts, and then there is our hello Twitch web part here. And uh, thank you for the follow. Um, so we can see here we have a class, hello Twitch web part, that extends base client side web part of I hello Twitch web part props. Okay. So this is TypeScript, right? And TypeScript is a language that was developed originally as a way to get C sharp developers comfortable with doing client side development, right? So, I mean, I, I think the, the reason why people are using TypeScript today is a little bit different, but it's Genesis. And as we'll see with the language syntax is, it's designed to be familiar to developers who, who know C-sharp, 
right? So there's classes, like I said before, interfaces, generics. Um, there's a lot of language structures that are familiar to a C-sharp developer. Async await is another one. Um, but all of this magic, right, the fact that there's classes and the fact that there's, you know, types, right? So we can, we can spe in, uh, specifically type stuff, for example, this, this um, property of this uh, interface is, is typed as a string and so on, is only applicable at runtime, or sorry, at development time, right? So when we compile this or when we transpile it is really more accurate, the result is JavaScript. So JavaScript doesn't have strong typing. It doesn't have classes, or at least depending on which version you're targeting. If you're targeting ECMAScript 5 specification that doesn't have classes, ES6 and so on does. Um, but it, it, it will generate JavaScript that simulates this, these object-oriented and other language features um, uh, in a way that's, that's still usable. It's still um, available to you uh, in the browser that you're targeting. Okay? So it, it just, it's it really just really important to understand that all these language features that you're seeing here are just things that you use during development. Um, they give you a development experience, again, a lot like you're used to in C Sharp. There's a lot of uh, features in Visual Studio, for example, refactoring and so on, that are available because of the, the, these language features. But these things sort of all go away when we transpile into JavaScript because that's what's actually going to be running in our browser. Okay? And then we have the render method here. So this is the method that says, um, what is our web part going to look like? And recall that for this project, I said, just use plain HTML and JavaScript. So that's exactly what we're doing. Now, it may not be clear on the stream, um, but this string, so basically all of this, is enclosed in backtick characters. So that's the character um, at the very top uh, right, sorry, top left of your keyboard, underneath the escape key generally. Um, and what the when you enclose a string in the with the backtick character, it allows you to intermix HTML and JavaScript, right? So anything that's enclosed in dollar sign curly braces, that's JavaScript, right? And then all the other stuff is HTML, right? So that we can see here, there's a another bit of JavaScript here. All right, so. You can see here that we have a span that says welcome to SharePoint. And we have another uh, paragraph tag here that says customize the SharePoint experience using web parts. And then it looks like we have the value of a property here. And then we have a button. All right. So how can we actually see this? Well, we can go back to our command prompt. And we can say gulp. Remember I said earlier that gulp is our task runner. And then we can use the command serve. So this is going to do several things. The first thing it's going to do is compile our TypeScript or transpile our TypeScript into JavaScript. It's then going to um, start up a localhost web server. And it's going to serve up our web part into what's called the local workbench, right? So this is a sure, this is a, a page specifically designed to enable us to test web parts. Okay. Now, what you want to do is you want to come down here and just make sure that the reload task is run. That's when you know that your web part is ready. Um, and in the local workbench, it'll generally refresh the page once that task is done. Then you can go ahead and open up the local version of the toolbox, and then you'll see your web part here. So we see our low Twitch web part here. And I can go ahead and open that up. And there we see the UI that's described in the render method here. Right? We see welcome to SharePoint, customize the SharePoint experience using web parts. And then there's hello Twitch, which is actually a web part property. So we can go ahead and edit that web part by clicking on the little uh, pencil icon here and, you know, saying hello Twitch, just out of space there, or um, 
hello uh, chat, and so on. And you notice as I edit the property over in the properties window, it actually goes and shows that immediately in the web part. Now, if you want to, you can have your properties window have a little apply button where the property values don't get applied until you click that apply button. But the default is that as you make changes in the properties, those are immediately applied um, in the actual web part. Okay, So this is the web part running in the local workbench. Now, what's really important to understand is that the local workbench is completely disconnected from SharePoint. Okay, So I can't... Uh, I can ask it for certain things. So I can say, what's the title of the current web? And it will give me a fake value. You know, but I, if I said, okay, show me what, what lists are available in this current site, or who's the current user in these kinds of things. Um, it will either just give me back an empty string or an empty array or a null value, um, because again, we're completely disconnected from SharePoint. Uh, so the, share, the local workbench is, is good when you first start you know, getting started with SharePoint, you wanna play around a little bit. And understand, but generally, you're going to be using what's called the hosted workbench, which is a workbench that's available in SharePoint 2016 and SharePoint 2019 and um, SharePoint Online. And we'll, we'll see more about the hosted workbench in, in just a second. All right, so let's come back over to um, our project here. And... Um, let me just make a quick change. So I'm going to change welcome to SharePoint um, to welcome to uh, my Twitch stream. Okay, and I'm going to save by doing Control S. I'm going to immediately switch back to my local workbench. And in a second, what you should see is that the text welcome to SharePoint changes to welcome to my Twitch stream. So. Node is monitoring the folder where the project exists for certain changes. And if we change HTML or JavaScript or TypeScript or JavaScript or CSS, it'll refresh and show us those changes immediately. Okay, now if we change configuration, it won't. We'll have to stop the server uh, and restart it. Um, so the way you do that is you go over here and you do Control C and say terminate, yes. And then you just run gulp serve again. And that will start up a new instance of the local workbench. And then you can go ahead and see the changes that you made in terms of changes to any kind of configuration. All right, so we're just going to wait for, make sure it gets to reload. It's not quite there yet. Okay, so there it's, the reload has happened, so now we can go ahead and reopen our web part. Okay. Um, so that's how to stop the running uh, Gulp Serve and uh, restart it if you should, should you need to. All right, so one of the first things that I want to talk about here is context. So if you're in doing SharePoint, uh, like farm solution development, uh, then we have the SP context object. If you're doing client object model, we have the client context. If you're doing uh, JavaScript injection, we have the underscore, underscore SP context info object in JavaScript. Basically, any kind of SharePoint development process has something that's going to give you access to the context. context. Um, so let's just go ahead and add a new um, line. So let's grab this line and copy it. And I can say here this, which is our web part. So this dot context, you can see we have that available, dot, and then there's a bunch of stuff in here. I'm not gonna go through all of it right now, um, but just, uh, I'll, I'll pick a couple of things. So you wanna make a REST API call to make you use the HTTP client. Uh, you wanna call off to Microsoft Graph. There's a client for that. Um, but the one you're going to use most often is this one called page context. And then dot here, we can see what's the current culture, what's the current language supported, basically. Um, what's the current list, if we're in something that has the context of a list or a list item. What's the current site collection, who's the current user, what's the current site. 
Um, so let's choose that one. And if I want to show the name of the site, I can add in um, title here. Right. So notice because we're using TypeScript, we're getting full IntelliSense. Right. Because TypeScript is strongly typed like C Sharp is. Um, so at development time, because we type things um, and we have, you know, uh, either classes or interfaces that define the properties and methods on those types, that we can get this full IntelliSense experience. So again, now if I go ahead and do Control S here and come back over to my local workbench, in a second below the property name, hello Twitch, we should see that we get, I believe, the word local workbench. And that's what we do. Right, so again, I'm not connected to SharePoint. So when I ask what the name of the current web is, it's not going to give me any kind of real value. It's going to give me a faked value that it has, a mock value um, that's available to them. Okay. Um, and of course, I, I, uh, if you have any questions while I'm going through all this stuff, just feel free to type them in chat. I'm constantly looking over um, to see if there are any questions. Now, what if we want to actually work with a web part that's connected to SharePoint? We can do that as well, as I mentioned, in the, the hosted workbench. So if I come over to one of my SharePoint online sites, and I go to the site URL slash underscore layout slash 15 slash workbench dot ASPX, I can access the hosted workbench. Okay. Um, so now when I open up the toolbox, it's going to show me all of the web parts that are available in the current site collection. Uh, but it's also going to show any locally running web parts, right? So our web part is still running locally in Gulp, you know, through Gulp Serve here. So because this page is running on my local machine, it can look to see, are there any web parts running locally? And if they are, we'll let you load them. So if I come down here, we can see there's our Hello Twitch web part. Okay. So the name of this website is Demo. So now we can see it's actually picking up the real name of our web part. Okay. Now, let me come back over to, to Visual Studio Code and make another change. Uh, my SharePoint, uh, SharePoint framework, whoops, point framework twitch stream and do control s and come back over here um, to our local workbench and in a second we should see welcome to my sharepoint framework twitch, twitch stream but over here in the hosted workbench it hasn't refreshed okay so unlike the local workbench the sharepoint the hosted workbench does not automatically update when um, you make changes in your project. You have to explicitly update it by clicking the refresh button here, and now we can see the changes that were that from our um, from our web part being reflected here in the hosted workbench. Okay, so it's just a, it's it's a difference you just have to be aware of. One of them refreshes automatically for you. One of them you have to manually refresh. All right, what if we want to know which environment we're in? Okay, um, so let me just go grab a snippet here. Um, it's this one. Okay, so you can see I have imports at the top here. Imports are basically the same as using statements in C Sharp. So I'm not adding any new code in here. I'm just saying that I want to use, or I want to make the the editor aware that I'm going to be using certain types from a certain library or package in this case. So I'm going to be using the environment and environment type types from the at Microsoft slash SP dash core dash library package. Okay. So as soon as I do that, I can now go and check what environment I'm in. Okay. So let's come back over here to our snippets and let's just go ahead and grab um, this guy here. And we'll, we'll talk more about working with the actual um, SharePoint envir environment and the data inside of it uh, in a little bit. But for right now, I'm just gonna do, do this. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is check to see is the environment type 
environment type dot local, right? So I can go here and check and see what's the environment type. Is it classic SharePoint, local, which is the workbench, uh, real SharePoint, or test, right? So if the environment type is local, I just want to tell the person, you know, this web part is not designed to work in the local workbench. And the reason I'm going to do that is because later on in a minute, we're going to add in code to go and access list information, and that's not going to be available on the local workbench. So there's no reason to, you know, show the web part and then have it not work the way it's expected. So we can just go ahead and write out that um, the web part isn't available on the local workbench. And now when this refreshes, we should just see a message to that effect. There we go. Because that is the local workbench. But over here, the environment is SharePoint. So we're actually going to see um, the web part um, in, in all its glory um, shown here um, in, in our hosted workbench. All right, so as I mentioned, let's, let's go, and add, go ahead and add some code that actually talks to a, a list. Uh, actually, or gets the, the lists that are available in the current site. Um, so I'll come back over here. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and just add a div into our UI where I'm going to inject the names of the lists. Okay. So the important thing here is that I have a div and the ID attribute of the div is list container. So I'm going to use, um, I'm going to select that item a little bit later on, uh, that div, and inject the names of the lists into it. Okay. Uh, now to be able to, to do this, I'm going to use the REST API. So I need to add it in um, another import. So that's this one up here, which is the SP HTTP client. So I'll go ahead and add that in up here. And that's from the package at Microsoft slash SP HTTP. And um, I'm going to add in a couple of interfaces. So I'll do that down here. So why do I have these? Well, I'm going to use the SharePoint REST API to ask for the names of, or the objects that represent the lists in the current site. Okay, so if you've done any work with the REST API, you know that um, what you're going to get back, depending on whether you set the um, accept header to O data verbose or O data no metadata, which I'm going to do, you're either going to get back dot an object that has a property called D, which has a property called results, and that's the array of the um, list objects, or if you use no metadata or minimal metadata then instead of dot d dot results, it's value, okay? So I'm going to get back an object that is a property called value, which is an array of objects that represent the individual lists. So here I'm creating an interface that says anything I say is an iList collection is an object that is a property called value, which is an array of iList objects. And we know that every single list has an ID, which is a number, and every single list has a title, which is a string. Now, there's other properties on the list object as well, but we don't care about those for this specific, specific example. So those just get ignored, right? So now I've created interfaces which represent the properties I care about for an individual list and op properties that I care about for a collection of lists. And now I can go ahead and add the code that calls out to the REST API. So it looks like this. And I can add that into my project down here at the bottom of the render method. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do here is just use uh, the query selector to get a reference to the div that I added up here. All right. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. The second thing I'm going to do is create the URL to make the REST API call, right? So it's the absolute URL to the current site plus slash underscore API slash web slash lists. And um, th in this case, I'm going to filter out hidden lists. So I, wanted, I don't want to show lists that are hidden 
um, that are generally like system lists. Okay. Then I'm going to go to the current context and use the SP HTTP client object to do a get request. So I'm going to pass in the rest URL I've created up here. And um, this SP HTTP client configurations v1 says it will do things like set the headers for me and so on. I don't have to explicitly do those. Uh, in this case, it would be like the accept header and so on. Now that is an asynchronous method. So what gets returned from this is a promise. Okay, so it's a promise of SP HTTP client response. So I need to wait for that to finish. When I do, the, it, I'll be signaled that it's done by um, the code calling whatever function I have in the then property. Uh, and it's going to receive a response of type SP HTTP client response. And what I need to do is check and see, did the call succeed? So um, unless the call doesn't actually get to the server or there's no response whatsoever, um, we'll get into the then method. Um, but we need to check and see, did I get back a response indicating success? Like did I get a 200 or a 201 or a 204, right? If I did, okay will be true. And then what I can do is go get the JSON, that's the data that came back in the response. If response OK is false, that means I got back like a 4, 400 or 401, 404, 500, one of those um, statuses that indicates failure. And in that case, I want to get the text that came back in the response and show that because that will be the error message. Okay, so we need to wait for the call to conclude. That's an asynchronous call. Then we need to actually use an asynchronous call to get either the JSON or the text. Um, it's really not an asynchronous call because the value is, is there available. It says as a stream. But anyway, we, we do that, and then that's going to come back as a promise, and then, we and then we wait for that promise to complete. And then we'll get our data, and now we're indicating that the data will be of the type iList collection. Right? So it's going to be an object that has a property called value which is an array of the list objects. So here you can see I'm for reaching over data.value, which is the array. Each of the objects in the array will be an I list. And I know every single list has an ID and title. So when I come back over here, I'll get IntelliSense to that effect. And then I can go ahead and just generate a span, which I'm going to inject into the div that I have the selector for up above. All right, so at this point now, I can go ahead and save. And I'm going to come back over to my console window. And I want to wait until I get to the reload task completed. There it is. It's completed. Um, so I can come back over to here. I no longer need my local workbench, so I'm just going to go ahead and close it. And now let me refresh over here. And there you can see now we see the um, names of the lists here in the bottom of our web part. Okay, so the web part rendered. Um, then at that point, the code to go make the REST API call was done. We got the, the information back from the REST API call, and then we injected the names of the lists into the div that was just a placeholder when the web part first got rendered. Okay, and again, this will only work in the hosted workbench because there's no connection to SharePoint in the local workbench. All right, so that's sort of the basics of building a web part using no SharePoint framework. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but I, just, I do want to show you the difference between a web part that um, uses no SharePoint framework, web, uh, no UI framework, versus one that uses React. So I have a project that I've generated here, Hello World React. I'll open up a command window and then open that up in Visual Studio Code. So again, we'll go to Source, Web Parts, and there is our web part. And just like before, it has a render method. But in this case, what it's saying is, 
Um, I'm not going to be responsible. I'm not responsible for rendering out the UI. The React component is. Okay. So what it's going to do is create an instance of the React component and have it go and um, inject the UI into into the DOM. Okay. Um, now, I didn't mention it previously, but it is important. Um, so we can see here this dot DOM element, and up here we see this dot DOM element. So when we, we use this code, we're not going and finding some specific element in the page using a class name or using uh, an ID and doing DOM manipulation that way. Basically, the SharePoint framework says, OK, here's an object that represents the DOM element that you can use. And you go ahead and tell me what you want to do with it. And then I'll make sure it gets put into the page in the right place, right? So one of the things that Microsoft has been extremely explicit about with the modern user experience is not to do DOM manipulation. So not to go and look at the page and find elements with specific IDs or specific class names and then go write you know, jQuery or some other code to go find those things and change how they look or add stuff in. Um, as we'll see with extensions in a little bit, Basically, they say, okay, we're going to give you an object, and you tell us what you, to do, what, what you want to do to that object, and we'll make sure that that gets reflected properly in the page, right? So, um, again, Microsoft has been extremely clear that that's the, the development model with the modern user experience rather than what we have done in the past, you know, with things like a content editor web part or a script editor web part and, um, and jQuery or JavaScript. All right, let's come back over to our React project here. So in this project, and it, underneath the Web Parts Hello World React, we have this components folder. And inside of there, we have a React component. Okay. So we can see something very similar to what we had in our um, JavaScript uh, no framework example, where we have um, some HTML and JavaScript mixed together that writes out, you know, welcome to SharePoint and customize the experience. Again, apologies for that. I need to turn the ringer off on that phone. Um, but, but instead of having it done by the web part itself, that piece is, um, the responsibility for that piece is separated out into the React component. Uh, so, and this is basically the way that any, um, UI framework works so that you have the, you know, sort of the, the, the piece responsible for orchestrating the different components, uh, but the individual components decide how the different pieces of the UI um, get rendered. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time doing React for a couple of reasons. One, it's just, you know, time. And two is because I, I, I'm very, very new at working with React. So, um, uh, trying to trying to do live coding here would be a lot of stumbling and fumbling, which uh, at some point in time is still valuable. It's valuable to see how you go, what the process is um, in developing and, and figuring out what went wrong, and then and so on. And we'll we'll do that uh, in later streams. But for now, I kind of just want to stick to um, to uh, the, the pieces that I've already got sort of prepared. All right. Um, so at this point. Uh, let's go through some other stuff in, in our project here outside of the actual web part itself. Um, so one of the first things I'll look at is this um, SCSS, which is pronounced SAS, even though it's not spelt SAS. But basically, this is the styling for our web part. Okay. So what happens is this stuff, this text that we see here, gets turned into a JavaScript class, right? So we can see here we have things like container and row and column, right? And if we take a look at our web part, we can see here we have container and row and column and so on, okay? So the way it works is you define your um, styling using SAS, which, which has extensions. I mean, you can just use plain CSS if you want to, but you can use extensions like these includes and so on 
Um, there's other things you can do. This is not an area of which I'm that familiar. I'm, uh, you know, I'm like basic CSS is about my level of understanding. Uh, I can get things done through trial and error, but, um, you know, a, a lot of these uh, things like, you know, push one, push two, and include and so on, it's, it, you know, I have to struggle to get it to work right. Um, but anyway, the important thing here is that you, you define the CSS, the styling here inside of your module.css file. That gets compiled into, into a class, and um, that's what you use over here. Sorry. Um, that's what you use over here in your, your web part. Now, one of the reasons Microsoft did this um, is that when these um, styles get created, the name of the style actually gets um, munged. Basically, it gets sort of um, modified in a way that makes it unique. Okay, So that if I have multiple web parts on the page or multiple UI elements, it doesn't really have to be web parts, that use the same style names, because the actual CSS style names that get generated have a piece, you know, a bit added to it that's designed to make sure it's unique, that if I have a style called, um, you know, big text, and someone else has a style called big text, that my big text will be called big text, you know, U8 pound or U8456, so that it's then unique from the other big text. All right. Um, also, they use that because the, it provides extensions uh, to CSS that are, that are quite valuable. Right. So those are the, the reasons why they decided to go ahead and use the SAS technique. But the important thing that you need to understand is that if you want to reference a style, you do it by referencing uh, a property off of the styles object. Right. And again, that gets generated from the SAS shown here. All right. So that's one thing. Next thing, let's take a look at the manifest for our web part. Um, there's a few things in here that are, that are important, but for right now, I'm just going to focus on, um, I think, this bit here. Okay. Uh, so the title of our web part, that's the name. So when I created the project using the SharePoint Framework Yeoman Generator, I said that the name of the project was Hello, or sorry, the name of the web part was Hello Twitch. So I can go ahead and modify that here. And I can also modify um, the description. So I can just change this to say, like, you know, this is a sample web part. Um, the Office UI fabric name. So if you're not familiar with this, let me just open up a browser here and go to the Office UI fabric. Um, this is a common set of styles that you can use to make your um, make your web parts or whatever you're building look and feel the same way as other stuff does in SharePoint or Office 365. And one of the things in here, uh, I think it's under, yeah, is icons. Okay. So you can go to fabric icons under, icon icon under iconography on the left-hand menu. And then you can scroll down and you can see the different icons that are available for you. Okay. Um, so what's this one called? Command prompt uh, or flashlight. You can just hover over them and you can see the name of the different web part. That should be, okay, there's save. Um, let's, let's go with command prompt. Uh, so let's make our web part, oh, no, hold on. Let's go with happy face. Emoji 2. Okay, so Emoji 2. Let's go ahead and try to use that. So let's come walk over here and say that we want to use Emoji 2. And if you spell it correctly, it works way, way better. Um, so this, is, this has to do with how the web part is represented in the web part gallery or the web part toolbox. Now, this bit here is the default value for any properties that you have. So I'll talk in a moment about properties, um, but let's just change this to um, hello chat. Okay, so that'll now become the default 
value for our property that we had. And our property is shown through this code right here, right, which shows a description property of our web part. Okay. All right, so at this point, we're, we're good. Um, so this is Hello World React. I don't want to show you that anymore. Um, this one should be Hello Twitch. Now, I made a modification to a configuration file, the manifest for the web part. Okay, so to be able to see that, I need to restart my gulp serve. So I'll go ahead and do that. And again, what we want to do is wait for the reload to happen. So I could monitor the console window, but when you have the local workbench, it's just easy to wait and see for the workbench to refresh itself. Uh, which happened in just a second here. There it goes. All right, so now I know my web part is ready to run in the local workbench. And now if I open this up, we should see there's our smiley face. If I hover over it, it says this is a sample web part, and there's my new title, All right? So this is a way that you can customize how your web part looks and feels in the web part gallery or the toolbox. Um, and then finally, let's just go ahead and open this up. Oh, shoot, I said it's not designed to work in the local workbench. So let's come back over to our hosted workbench and refresh. And we see hello Twitch, and that's because this web part was already on the page. So the property value has already been set. Um, the way I can re make the page reload the web part is by clicking discard up here. Um, so that basically removes the existing web part. And now if I go and re-add it, and again, we should see now um, our smiley face there. You can see that the um, property value has been set to our proper default, uh, which is, or the default we just, we just told it to use, which is hello chat. All right, so um, let's go ahead and just do that and close the local workbench and come back. Actually, let's just close this. So when you have multiple projects open up in Visual Studio Code, um, you don't say, you say file close window. So I have multiple windows open, but I wanna keep this, uh, this guy open here. Um, there's a few other files that are important. Let's go into the config folder here, okay? Um, package solution JSON is an important one. So when we get to deployment, we're going to actually create an app package that goes into the app uh, uh, app catalog in SharePoint. So for example, if we wanna set the name of our package, we can do that here. If we wanna set the name that's shown in the app catalog, we can change this here. Um, if we wanna change the version number, Okay, so if you want to change the version as you're deploying new versions of your package, you can change the package version there. And then these three settings um, are related to the choices that we made when we first created our project. And there was two choices that we were given. One is, do we want the admin to have the ability to um, deploy our package tenant-wide? So that's this one called skip feature deployment. So when skip feature deployment is true, that means that the admin does have the ability to say that they want to deploy tenant wide. If skip, skip feature deployment is false, then they, they don't. Um, is domain isolated is true or false was the second question in which we said no to, which I'm still not gonna cover what that question is about. Again, if you don't know for sure that you wanna use it, just always say no. And then this one called include client-side assets has to do with deployment and a CDN, which we'll talk about towards the end of, of the stream. Okay. So that's an important one. Um, config, JSON, is there anything in there we need to talk about? Uh, nope. No, that's good. Package JSON down here in the root of your project is another important one. Okay, so this, the, this indicates what are the dependencies, what are the package dependencies uh, that this project has? And these are all the default ones that you get. So for example, 
uh, at Microsoft SP Core Library, SP Web Part Base, um, Office UI Fabric Core, and so on. Um, so there's a bunch of dependencies here. This will become important when you're doing things like, you know, getting a project off of Git. Um, and you want to see what packages it's using, or when you want to update a project. So currently, as I mentioned, we're using the .NET Framework, sorry, the .NET Framework, the SharePoint Framework Generator version 1.9.1. .1. Um, but, you know, in, sometime in the future, there'll be 1.10 or 1.11 or 2.0 or whatever it happens to be. And I may eventually want to update my project to use the latest version of the SharePoint Framework. Um, so that's where we'll, we'll change these dependencies and then reload uh, the, the packages from the internet uh, to be able to do that update, okay? So package.json is um, an important uh, file as well that you'll, you'll see and use a little bit later on. And the last one, um, urc.json, uh, the, the really th important one I use here is just what version of the, fr of the framework generator was used to generate this project. So that's why you won't go into tons, but you know it's there. It's something that's important to understand. All right. So at this point, we can probably go back to the slides and just make sure that I've covered everything I want to. Uh, so I talked about creating a client-side web part and using the SharePoint Framework Generator. Talked about the render method and the workbench both the hosted workbench and the local workbench. Um, I talked about using the context. Um, so things like, you know, the current site, the current user, the current site collection, and so on. Uh, I showed you how to communicate with SharePoint. Uh, I did talk about handling events. Um, so the big, th big part here is that um, you go and get a reference to the element um, where you want to handle the event, like that'll be like a, things like a button, or perhaps um, a drop down, these kinds of things. Um, and then in the event listener, you use the arrow functions, anonymous functions to do the handler. Um, the reason why you want to use that rather than an actual G, uh, JavaScript function um, is be it, it it preserves this, right? So if you've done any JavaScript development in the past. Um, you'll know that depending on the context, this can mean this, or it can mean that, or it can mean something else, right? But it, when we're working with um, the, the SharePoint, or we're basically when we're working with TypeScript, we want to preserve what this means to be whatever the class that we're in represents. Um, so if you use the arrow functions, that will happen, right? If you use anonymous functions using this syntax, then this, gets, this ends up getting preserved. All right, um, so web part properties. Here's a good one to talk about, okay? So I already showed you where we can set the default properties here in the manifest, but let's go ahead and take a look at creating a custom web part property. All right, so I'll come back to um, my web part here, and we can see up here we have an interface which defines our web part properties. So it's I hello Twitch web part props. And it says currently we have one property which is called description and it's a string. Okay. And then down here we have some UI code that shows the value of the property. And then down even farther we have the code that tells. Um, SharePoint how to render UI so that the user can edit the property, right? So we have a property pane text field, which edits the property name description, um, and then has a label which comes from the strings. So this is something that allows you to do um, support multiple languages. So it's like you know, it's like the same thing with resource files. Right, so under LOC, we have uh, my strings, and then we actually, the names uh, of the, str the strings, and then you can put the actual a language supported. Um, so it's basically the same as using resource files uh, when you're doing like .NET development. 
Okay, You can use those if you want to, or if you know you're only going to use a single language, you can hard code them. I'll show an example of hard coding them right now. But what I want to add is another property called color. Okay, So let's come back up to our interface, which defines our properties here. And I'll say I'll have a new property called color, and color will be a string. Okay, And then I want some UI to show the color. Uh, so let's go down here. I don't need that. Um, oh, I think I just copy and paste. Yeah. So let's just grab this and copy and paste it. Uh, and I'll say here, um, color is this dot properties. And instead of description, I want dot color. Okay. Uh, and then now I want to come down here and grab this guy. And where I have my description of the editors for my properties, I want to add a new one in. Uh, so group fields, so it comes after here, so comma, and then paste this in. So I want to have a drop down, which edits the color property. The label beside it will be color, and then the options are red, green, and blue. Now notice the squiggly here for the property pane drop down. That's because I have not included the appropriate, appropriate import statement, and Visual Studio Code is saying, I don't know what this, what this identifier means. Okay, so let's come back up to the top. And here's where our property pane text field is imported. And now I just need to say here, property pane drop down. I want to import that as well. And now that squiggly down below should go away. Okay, so we update the interface to say that we have a property. We, um, if you want the user to be able to edit the property in the properties window, then we update the code and get property pane configuration to provide the appropriate editor for the user to edit the property. And then optionally, you can go ahead and set the default value for the property. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll set the default value for color to be blue. Okay, so I'll save that. I'll save that. I've modified my configuration, so I need to restart my Gulp serve. So we'll go ahead and do that. Um, let's go start the local workbench. I don't want that. And um, actually, let's go ahead and close. Let's let's do this. Let me just stop this. Yes. Okay, I don't want it to open the local workbench anymore, right? Because all it's going to do is tell me that this web part isn't, doesn't work in the local workbench. I want it to instead go to the hosted workbench, okay? So what I can do is just grab this URL to the hosted workbench, come back to my project, in the config folder, open up serve JSON, and change the initial page from the page for the local workbench to the page for my hosted workbench. Okay, So now when I run gulp serve, it's going to load the web part in the hosted workbench rather than the local workbench. Okay, So again, what did I do? I grabbed the URL to the workbench, went to serve JSON, and updated the value of the initial page um, property. So now when I do gulp serve, Instead of, again, opening up the local workbench, it's going to open up the hosted workbench. I'm going to wait till it gets to the reload task. There it is. And now I'm going to refresh the local, or sorry, the hosted workbench. And I'm going to open up or add my web part to the page. 
And there we can see that the color is blue. That is our default color that we set in the manifest for the web part. And now we have a picker where I can say the color is red or the color is green or the color goes back to blue. Okay. Now, if you notice, every single time I do that, it's going, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> my apologies. It's going and retrieving the list again. Um, so that's something that we could, there's some more code we could add to say, well, if you already have the list, just get the list values and, and persist them so that we don't have to reload them every single time. Um, so there's ways to have it not completely refresh the entire user experience for the web part if you don't want it to. Um, and instead, just update the value of that property. But that's a little bit um, beyond the scope of this particular stream. All right. So we've talked about that. Um, debugging. There is a way. There's an add-in for Visual Studio Code where you can debug right here in Visual Studio Code. And if you want to use that, that's perfectly up to you. I just find using the debugger that's included in the browser is the easiest way, right? So for example, if I want to debug my code here, um, I'm just going to come in here and throw in a debugger statement to force the debugger to start and save. And um, then go ahead and wait for the reload and then come back to my page here, open up the browser's dev tools, and then refresh the page. And there we fit our debugger statement. Notice it's debugging the TypeScript, um, not the JavaScript, right? Then, even though it's running the JavaScript, it's debugging the TypeScript. Uh, the reason is that we have map files available, right, that map the JavaScript to the TypeScript. So you can go ahead and debug that. And if I want to see the data, I can go ahead and come in here and hover over data. Of course, this is not going to work for some reason. Um, all right, let me add a watch. That hover should work, but let me get the data in there. And we can see that's an object that is has a value property, which is an array. We can see the values of the array and so on. Uh, I'm not sure why the hover isn't working there. Uh, normally it does. But anyway, you have, all, you have access to all of the debugging tools that your browser makes available for you. So generally, that's the way I do debugging. Um, but as I mentioned, if you want to use the add-in for Visual Studio Code, you absolutely can. Um, that works fine. And I believe that there's a mention of that on the, uh, yeah, there we go, on the slide itself. All right, how about using other libraries? So you have a couple options here. Um, you can use NPM packages. So I can add NPM packages into my project. Or I can add external references to um, JavaScript files in a CDN. Um, it's, it's really up to you. There are, when you make the choice, if you use NPM packages, it will probably increase the size of your bundle. I'll talk about that when we do deployment, but basically it'll increase the size of the thing that gets put up into, into SharePoint Online that basically implements your web part, the files that, that do that, okay? Whereas the external reference, um, after the, when the web part's loading, it goes ahead and, and retrieves the, um, the library, in this case, um, the example shows jQuery, um, from the CDN. And if you already have it on your machine, then it will use the cache version probably and so on. So there's a couple different ways to do that. I'm going to show you how to use an external JavaScript library. There's lots of documentation that talks about both ways. Um, I'll just show you one. Okay. So let's take a look at it, installing an NPM package. And this is a package that doesn't implement jQuery. What it does is it has the type information of the jQuery objects, right? So I, I want to have full IntelliSense and type checking and so on in my project. 
So I can go ahead and add an NPM package in here that has the type information for jQuery. So when I make that command, it's gonna go and um, download that package and add it into my project. Uh, if you're not familiar with the syntax here, it's at types slash jQuery is the project name. And I'm specifically requesting version 2.0.48 um, because that is the type information that's compatible with the version of jQuery, which I'll be using, uh, which I believe is 2.2.4. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to go to my config JSON and I'm going to add an external reference. Uh, and you can see it is 2.2.4. So I'm going to get jQuery from the Cloudflare um, uh, CDN. Uh, so I'll come back to my project here. I'll go to under the config folder, config JSON. There is an external section here. And I'll go ahead and add in that I'm using jQuery. Okay, so I've added in types. I've added in the external reference to jQuery. And the last thing I'm going to do is if I want to use this is add in an import statement. So coming back to my imports here, um, I'll just at the bottom, it doesn't matter, right here. So I'm going to import star as jQuery from jQuery. Okay. So now I can go ahead and use jQuery. Um, and generally the way I would do that, um, let's do this here. Right, so up here at the top, I'm going to say um, private container. Uh, I can't remember the main, I think it's just as jQuery. So the type is um, jQuery. I'll find out in a second here, uh, is equal to null. Okay, um, and then at the top of my render method, I'm going to say uh, this dot container um, is equal to jQuery and then pass in this dot DOM element. Okay. Um, and this returns uh, jQuery. Okay, so I was right. Uh, so now I have the container, right? So over here, if I wanted to get this list container, I could say now, um, let list container two equal um, this dot container. So that's the jQuery element that represents the the main the root element for my web part, right? Um, dot find, and then it's pound, and then the type name or the ID. Sorry. Okay, so let's throw in a debugger statement there and do control S uh, and wait, oh, sorry, we haven't gulp serve, so let's go ahead and gulp serve here. And that's going to again load our hosted workbench and we need to wait for the reload task. There we go. And we'll refresh our hosted workbench. And we'll go and add our web part into the page. And now let me open up the debugger tools and refresh the page. And let's see if I can actually hover this time. Nope, it's not gonna let me. So I'll add a watch statement, delete that guy, add in, um, list container two, enter, and we can see that that's a jQuery object, right, as expected. So now, so we can see that jQuery has been loaded and is working um, in our project. We saw we had IntelliSense for it and so on. Okay, um, so this is this will be a, a really common process, uh, whether you are adding in NPM packages for certain um, additional functionality or whether you're adding in references to external libraries. Uh, it's something you'll be doing. You'll be doing quite often. 
Um, extensions. So let's see. Uh, we've been going for an hour and a half here. Uh, I'm going to go through the extension just in the slides. Um, I, I don't want to make the stream super, super long. Um, so as I mentioned, there's three kinds of extensions. Probably the most commonly built is the application extension, which allows enables you to um, add in a common header or footer, right? So let me just go back to where we were in the slides. It talks about that, right? So a common header or footer. Um, an example that, that I've used uh, is adding in a, a menu system, menu, menuing system for a client that is available across every single page in the tenant. So we do that as a custom header. Um, I've seen the custom footer used. Uh, for example, if you use the the current multi uh, multi multiple oh geez, the PNP uh, add-in or extension that enables you to do multiple language site pages or have light site pages that support multiple languages that uses a footer. Um, but again, I've seen this extension used used extensively across different projects. The field customizer again, it's it's really it's really rare that you use that now with the JSON um, column formatting, and then the command set customizer is quite quite powerful. Um, you know, you want to be able to do certain actions on certain um, items in a list or certain documents in a document library. You can go ahead and and do that. Now, the one thing uh, that I do want to talk about around extensions, let me go over to here and open up this guy. Actually, there's a couple things I want to talk about in relation to extensions. Um, but first, we'll go here to source. This is an application extension. So um, there's no render method. There's an init method uh, when the extension gets initialized. Uh, so one is there's when you create an extension, there's no UI framework, right? Um, if you want to use a UI framework, I guess you could. Um, but basically, the extension is designed to uh, work with just HTML and JavaScript. Um, and the second thing is that you can't test extensions in the workbench. They have to be tested in a, in a local share, or sorry, a hosted SharePoint page. Okay. So if we go back to that link I have, and it's still in the chat. If you if you have it, if you don't, I'll put it back in again. Um, but if you go to that training. Uh, let's, do we have it open? We don't. Um, let me just go there. aka.ms slash um, spfx dash training. There's a whole training module that covers um, SharePoint framework extensions, how to use them, how to debug them, how to deploy them, uh, and, and so on. Okay, so let's come back over here and get back to where we were. External libraries extensions. OK, now let's talk about deployment. So when the SharePoint framework was first released, deployment required two steps. So let me, hold on. I don't know how I can do. Eventually, I think that my, there, my two fingers finally get into, the, into this uh, video. Anyway, it, deploy, it, it required two steps, OK? Um, so one was you would deploy the bundle which is which are the JavaScript and CSS and, and um, static files that implement your web part or extension, you would deploy them to a CDN. And then the second step would be to deploy the app package to the app catalog. So since fr SharePoint Framework version 1.4, that can be reduced into one step where you can say, I want to include my bundle in the app package, and I want SharePoint to automatically host the um, bundle in a CDN for me. I don't want to have to worry about doing it. Okay, so most people now use the second option, which is the single step deployment. However, if you have an organization where people are using SharePoint online globally, uh, you might want to use the first option to ensure that. Um, the files are fit, like you know deployed across a CDN 
where the files are physically closer, like so it's multiple servers worldwide, uh, the CDN, and the files will be physically closer to um, the user of the files so that they, um, the, the performance of the web part, the initial loading of the web part will be quicker. Um, it's really up to you, but um, I'm gonna show how to do the single step deployment, but you can actually do it in two steps still if you want to. And your CDN can be an Office 365 document library that's configured to be a CDN um, using the Office 365 CDN. You can use Windows Azure for your CDN, um, or there's other non-Microsoft CDNs available out there. Cloudflare would be an example that you can use if you want to. All right, um, so let's, let's take a look at deploying our uh, web part. All right, um, so first off, let me just go ahead and close this extension. So close window, and let me go ahead and close this guy here. And let me stop serving this up. Okay, so let's come over to eDev, hello, Twitch, here, and um, take a look at temp. All right. So step one is to run a gulp command, gulp bundle. So gulp bundle on its own is like a debug build in Visual Studio. And if you have the dash dash ship switch, that's like a release build. Okay, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna deploy this um, out to your app catalog uh, for release, then you wanna add the dash dash ship. So we'll get, this takes like 15, 20 seconds to run. It's not super long. Um, and what it's doing is it's transpiling the TypeScript into JavaScript. Um, then it is both bundling and minifying um, uh, the, the TypeScript, CSS, and other static files. And those get put into temp deploy. Okay, so that's just what got created right there we can see there's a JSON file and two JavaScript files um, that will make up the files that implement our web part. And this is what would go into the CDN if would we were we doing a two-step deployment, okay? Um, so that's step one. And then step two is to create the app package. So that's gulp package dash solution dash dash ship. And this is going to create a file that goes into, there's going to be a folder called SharePoint created in just a second. And then solution. And there is our app package. And if we want to see what's in the app package, we can click on debug here. And that's what's contained in the app package itself. So now we're going to deploy the solution to the app catalog in our SharePoint framework tenant. So I'm going to grab the path to that uh, folder, put it on the clipboard, and I'm going to come over to here. And if you're not familiar with the app catalog, um, you can go to your SharePoint admin center. You do that by going to um, the URL for your root SharePoint, right? So actually, let me just open this up in another window. I'll go through the whole process for you. Um, so my tenant is called Rob Windsor Test 986. So it's Rob Windsor Test 986. And then I'm going to add in SharePoint.com. So that is the URL to my root site collection. And then after the tenant name, you add in dash admin. Okay, so Rob Windsor Test 986-admin.sharepoint.com. And... Then here, we're going to click on More Features in the left-hand nav. And somewhere in here should be Apps. Okay, so there's our app. That's where we get into our app catalog. So I'll click on that. Click on App Catalog. And if I do have an app catalog, it'll navigate there. If I don't, it will take me to a page I can use to create it. And basically, an app catalog is just a site collection that has some specific libraries and content types and stuff built into it to host apps, okay? Um, currently, the app catalog only works in Classic View. 
So I have seen, a, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the steps are to get there, but I've seen a couple times where the app catalog is loaded in modern view. You do not want that because deployment will not work in modern view. So you want to make sure that you're in classic view when you go to deploy. All right. So I'm going to go to apps for SharePoint. And then I'm going to choose Upload and choose Files. And I'm going to paste in the URL to that um, folder containing our app package. There it is there. Hello, Twitch. Click Open. Click OK. And in a second, a dialog is going to pop up. Now, as I mentioned, um, when we created the project, one of the settings was, do you want the administrator to be able to make our web part or extension, in this case, it's a web part, available across the entire tenant? If you say yes there, then this checkbox is available, Okay, which says, make the solution available to all sites in the organization. If you don't say yes when you create the project, that checkbox is not available. Right? And you have to add the web part into each individual site collection that you want to use it using add an app. I'm going to say, make this solution available across all sites in the organization so I don't have to go in to any site collection where I want to use the web part and say, add an app. Um, and it also is telling me the CDNs that are going to be used. So the SP client-side asset library that's the CDN that SharePoint uses um, to host the bundle. But I'm also using jQuery from cdnjs.cloudflare.com, so it's showing me that as well. So it's showing me where the assets that are going to be used in this web part or extension or combination of those things are coming from. Okay, So I'm going to go ahead and click Deploy here. And in a second, we should see, hello, Twitch. There it is. Hello, Twitch client-side solution. So again, hello, Twitch client-side solution. Hello, Twitch. Where are these names coming from? They're coming from the package solution JSON file in the config. Right. So there's the name that was shown. So you can configure that. There's the name of the package. There's the version number, version 1.0.0.0, right? You can see that there, right? So you can configure these things in the package-solution-json file in the config folder. Uh, another important thing is you check to see whether there was no errors, okay? I have banged my head against walls um, over and over again going, why is this thing not working? Only to come back to um, the app catalog and realize, oh, my deployment didn't work correctly. That's why it's not working. Um, so it's important to check that as well. All right, so now that that's done, we should be able to go ahead and use our web part in one of our SharePoint sites. Um, so let me close these and close this. Just clean up a little bit. All right, so let's just go to one of my site collections. I got this one called Demo3. That'll work just fine. And I'm gonna go to Pages. And I'll create a new site page. And I'll turn comments off and just clean up just so we can see stuff a little bit easier. All right, and now I'm gonna go to my toolbox. Now notice we're not, you know, the web part is not being hosted locally. Right, so there's nothing up my sleeve here. I'll open up the web part toolbox and come down, and there's hello Twitch. Okay, and there is our web part. I go ahead and publish this. And that theme is um, leave something to be to something to be desired. Uh, let me try that again. Uh, oh, I didn't set the name of the page. Um, hello Twitch. Now we can go ahead and publish. Okay, I just, sorry, I just cannot deal with that theme. Uh, we're gonna change the look. Let's go with teal. 
There we go. Much better. Um, all right. So that is the deployment process. The deployment process is basically the same whether you're deploying um, a web part or an extension. It's called bundle ship, called package, package solution ship. Uh, the package goes up into the, um, into the app catalog. Now, if you wanted to deploy to a CDN, the steps would be this. One, you would go create a folder or create whatever the, the container is in the CDN. Then you would go to write manifest JSON. You would put in the path or the URL to your CDN here. Um, you would do gulp bundle dash dash ship, gulp package solution dash dash ship. The files that got created in the bundle process, which are in slash temp slash deploy, would go up into your CDN, and then the package would go into the app catalog in exactly the way that I showed you. Right. So if you want to do the two-step deployment process, that's what you end up doing. Okay. But again, that's that's optional. All right. Um, so I talk about configuring a CDN. That's if you want to use that deployment there. Um, talked about that. Uh, the client side assets, making stuff available across. Uh, your entire tenant. We talked about that. Deleting a project folder. Okay, let's talk about that. So, were I to go into um, Windows Explorer and go to here and click the delete button, uh, it would go calculating how much it's going to take for us to delete this. And you sit there and wait for three minutes, five minutes, whatever. And then it eventually goes and deletes it, right? But there's a lot of folders um, there under node modules and so on. So I don't know. You can do that if you want to, if you're patient. I'm not, I'm not patient. Um, so what, I, what you can do instead is you can get this tool called RimRAF. So you just use npm install. So it would be npm install dash g. RimRAF, I believe. That should be on the slide. Uh, oh, it's in this blog. It's in this post right down here. But basically, that's the command you would run to get RimRAF. Um, and then once you have it, you can say RimRAF node. Oh, I don't want to do this here. Um, let's go. Hello World 2, I think I have. Yeah, I'm not using this one. So rimraf node underscore modules. Okay, so let's go to hello world two. Um, and let's just open up this. And what it's doing is it's using uh, behind the scenes, it's going in and deleting all the folders and subfolders and files um, in the node modules folder. Okay, so the reason why it's called rimraf is because um, to delete uh, folders um, cascading in Linux. It's rm space r dash rf, I believe. Um, so that's where the name came from. But the important thing is that the node folder, node modules folder is now gone. And now if you go take a look at Hello World 2, instead of containing 400 and something megabytes worth of files, it contains like 650K. Um, so now deleting it is easy. Okay. So that's just, you know, uh, oh, it's open. Uh, right, so um, that's just an easy way to go ahead and delete a project. And uh, again, like there's the, each folder has like 400 and something megabytes worth of files. So you, you need to be cognizant of how much disk, disk space you're using, depending on, you know, I have a terabyte drive here, so that's not a problem for me. But if you're on like a surface that has, you know, like a 256 uh, gig drive, um, then you might want to make sure that you start cleaning up after yourself uh, for learning projects and tests and that kind of stuff. Okay, here. All right, resources. So I showed you earlier docs.microsoft.com slash SharePoint. That's where all the official docs are. A lot of really great stuff in there. Uh, the training content, so aka.ms slash SPFX training. 
Uh, I'm not sure my cursor has this kind of like weird. Anyway, that's not important. Um, so there's training modules on um, setting up your development environment, creating web parts, web part properties, extensions, using the REST API, calling out to the graph, Microsoft Graph, uh, deployment. Um, oh, Teams, creating SharePoint framework web parts that work in Teams. A lot of really cool stuff there, all free, all available for you. If you do want um, uh, a more extensive retail training course, there's a course by uh, a gentleman named Andrew Connell. Um, so if you go to that link, uh, the Voitanos link, you can get to that. That's available for you. Again, that is, that's a retail product or offering. Um, and then uh, the main GitHub repo for the SharePoint framework is github.com slash SharePoint. Uh, so I'll put this link again in the uh, chat here. Let me just go grab that. This is the link where you can download uh, not only the slide deck, but all the samples that I have, I showed. Um, it is case sensitive. So uh, that last bit, uh, Windsor SPFX, uh, that is case sensitive. So you need to use a capital W and a capital S there. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, um, oh, thank you. I'm glad I could help. Uh, just comment in the chat there. Um, if you have any questions at all uh, after the session, you can feel the feel free to ping me on my my uh, Twitter handle at Rob Windsor. Um, I, this video will be available on demand here on Twitch for the next week. Um, but I'm going to also download it and put it onto my YouTube channel so it's, it's available uh, hope, well, permanently as or as permanent as we currently understand. Um, so uh, again, uh, my YouTube channel, uh, which I named a long time ago and I kind of wish I could change, but it doesn't seem that's available, is uh, youtube.com slash Toronto Geek. Um, so that's available as uh, shown for you there here uh, in the bottom right. Um, so again, I appreciate everybody who joined uh, in your time. I uh, hope you found this information valuable. And um, I might do a stream on Friday. Uh, not exactly sure. If not, I'll do I'll definitely do one um, next next week sometime. So just uh, follow my twi uh, Twitter handle. And, uh, follow my, my my tweets. And uh, I'll be I'll be informing people when I'm going to be streaming next. So uh, thanks very much again, and uh, have a great day. And we'll talk to you soon.